It is Wednesday afternoon. It is January 4th, 2023. I'm amazed. Here we are. We said we'd be back before we knew it, and I think we are. <laughs> I trust you all had a, a beautiful holiday season. Remembering the reason for the season is Jesus, but I also like that the reason for every season Thank always. You, Lord, for the rain. <laughs> and we've got at least one thanking the Lord for the rain and another saying amen to it. We have so much to be thankful for. And it is with joy that I welcome you all back. I'm thrilled you want to be back because I'm looking forward to sharing with you. And without further delay, we're going to pick up in Genesis 15, Bereshit chapter 15. We're going to review real quickly from verse 1 to get our mindset and get us all together, even though we did the first four verses in our last class. Any of you who have not been right up on the video or aren't watching it by video, I feel like you, you, if you're like me, you need that little refresher. So we open chapter 15 with the fact that there was a fourth appearance to Avram of his God, of Elohim, Hayim, the Most High God, the God of Israel, is the one who has been dealing with Avraham. He's known as Jehovah, which is the, the self-existent one who's revealing himself. He's known as Adonai, which is the master and teacher. We'll be getting all that, I think, again, even in our review. So let me just go on, and, and it, we're told in verse 1, after these things, after the results of chapter 14, chapter 14, we had the war of four kings against the war of five kings coming against them. We had Avram's nephew Lot be taken away in war. We had Avram go after him, bring him back. We had the appearance of Melchizedek, my God is righteous, uh, or my king is righteous. We uh, saw that he either was a personification, a theophany, a Christophany of Messiah himself, Yeshua, Jesus of, of God, or he was made to look like. And you can choose which according to how you feel from the scriptures. But as we come into um, all of that, with all that background, remembering that Avram's just been through war, took on many in the power of God, won the victory. But now after these things, he's moving forward and he's being reminded by the Lord not to be afraid because he could be thinking, I won the battle, but is the war over? Or are they going to come after me because now I've taken booty from well, Avram didn't take it personally. He gave it to the kings that, that were uh, allied with him, but he did bring back his nephew and whole family. That he took for himself again also. So the word of the Lord comes to Avram, and this is the first mention that we had of the word in Scripture. It reminds us of Yochanan 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. We see that as being Yeshua because verse 14 says, the word came and tabernacled among men. The word came and dwelt with men, so we know that it's speaking to us of uh, Jehovah uh, appearing in the person of his son, Yeshua Jesus. I want to make sure that I'm very clear for any just plugging in that I'm speaking fully of the deity of Yeshua Jesus. When he was in his human form, he was still fully God. 100% divine, 100% human, the two in one body, the, the divine uh, allowing itself to be confined within that body for the purpose of reaching humankind with redemption. Wow. Only God could mastermind such a planet, and I was going to say pull it off, but more than pull it off. Planet, develop it, do it, fulfill it. Amazing. But uh, we aren't to that point yet. We're in the very beginning. Although right in the beginning from chapter 3 on, we've seen the promise of that coming Messiah uh, to be the Redeemer for mankind. In this case, he's appearing to Abraham in a vision. First time we saw a vision in Scripture. We know God spoke or speaks to people as a personal appearance. We've just talked about with an audible voice we saw in the garden, with visions and dreams as we move through Scripture. The Spirit of God works on the mind. He works through the ministry of angels. He works through prophets. He works through teachers. He is not limited. He talked through a donkey. <laughs> so, I mean, why not? He created the donkey. <laughs> so he's, nothing is beyond his use. And, and uh, he comes to us in different ways, different purposes, and to touch people in different ways. In this vision, his first words to Avram are, do not fear. 
And it's the first time we've got that in scripture. We're going to have that by the time you're through with scripture. That means by the time you've gotten to the book of Revelation, you'll have heard that. Some have said 365 times that it says, do not uh, be afraid or do not fear or something to, you know, along that line. I haven't uh, added them all up, but I'm going to take their word for it. I know that I do see it repeatedly. And we know if the Lord is telling us once, it's important. If he's telling us again, be listening. If he's telling us that many times, I think he knows that's a common problem among man. And really, we do the Lord such a disservice when we fear because it's as if we're saying, Lord, you're not going to come through. You're going to let me down. And we're fearful for no good reason because he never never abandons, never lets us down, never forsakes, and always works everything together for our good. Doesn't mean everything is good, but he'll work it for your good. He will bring good out of it. That's our amazing God. So Avram, yes, you may have defeated these kings. You may be thinking the thoughts that they could be coming after you, but put your head down on your pillow tonight and go to sleep, trusting that your God is going to be your shield and your protector and that there is nothing you need to fear because that's what he says, I am a shield to you. This is before we have the great I am. It is different words in our Hebrew, but it's still the idea behind it is the self-existing God, the one that needs nothing to exist. He's totally within himself, bringing to himself everything he needs for existence. And he exudes that in the, the manifestations we see around us. This one, who needs nothing, lacks nothing, is above all, beyond all, beyond what your mind can imagine or think, is saying to Avram, I am your shield. Now, honestly, if he had said another person is Avraham's shield, then Avram could worry if that person were to let him down. If he even said, Avram, you're a strong man. Look, you've done battle now, no worries. Avram could still shake in his boots because he knows he's human and he knows that means there's ups and downs and, and issues to deal with. But no, he's telling him, don't fear on the basis that I, the God who created all, sustains it all, keeps it all, the God who needs nothing, I am a shield to you. A shield is protection. It's a place that behind that shield you're in security and you are in rest. You're not worried about the darts of the enemy going through the shield. So if your shield is up good and surrounding you, you are protected. And that's what God is promising Avram. But then he goes on and he tells him a bit more. He says, your reward shall be very great. Remember, Avram turned down the reward that he had right to for winning the war. But he turned down all of the earth, earthly possessions Said, I want nothing from it. I, he was not going to let anyone say that they had made Avram rich. If he was rich, it was going to be by God's hand. And he was only looking to God for his reward. And we see that he had lost nothing by giving up the, the earthly goods because his God is rewarding in a greater way. Avram had lost nothing putting his trust in the Lord and uh, rather than the king of Sodom who offered him some of the booty, that he actually gained what the world could not give, and that is God himself. When he gains that, what a reward that is. God himself is the reward still today for all those who are faithful to him. If you're putting your trust in him, he is your shield. So if God is going to promise Avram reward right now, Avram's going to bring to him the greatest desire of his heart. He's going to ask for the inheritance the promise of a seed and an heir. When to pass on what God has blessed him with, he wants that progeny. He wants a son that's his own. He's not interested in worldly riches, but he does want this blessing from God. So he raises that question in verse 2, and Abram says, O oh Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless? <clears throat> now, we saw last time in detail, so again, just a quick reminder. The name here for God is Adonai Yehovah. First time it's been made a compound name. When we see Adonai alone, the word is usually translated master. It can be Lord. Um, it, it's the idea of what, uh, master over um, a class, you know, like teacher, master, teacher. It can be like a lordship over those who are his subjects. 
It can also have the idea in it of a husband who isn't to lord it over his wife, but is to be the head of the house to protect the wife and to take care of her needs. We saw all those verses last time, so I won't go into them now. We saw also that the Jehovah side, again, is reminding him that this is the self-existing God, the God who needs nothing but is revealing himself to him. So Abram's calling on him. He's calling on the God who needs nothing. He's call, calling on the God who is his master, who is his teacher, who is his Lord. And he's saying to him, I'm departing. In, in actuality, the idea that we get is Abram thought he is dying. Now, not in the sense that I'm going to croak tomorrow <laughs> because we know he's asking for a son. He's asking for, you know, a progeny to pass down to, um, one to go on beyond himself. So it's not that he thought that he was going to die in that sense, but he knew his body was aging. He knew that he was very near, if not already, beyond the age of ability to reproduce. And that's what he says, see, I'm going childless. I don't have an heir. I don't have a son. And he realizes that he has to have a son first to be the heir. That's how you become an heir, is you become a son. And then you are heir to what is your parents. We again looked at all of that in the verses in Romans and other places, but we also took into effect that in his time, there was what was called the Code of Hammurabi. And that code did say that if someone passed away without children, the head servant of their home would be the one who would gain their riches, who would be the, the one to inherit their estate. So Avram does have Eliezer of Damascus. This is uh, his most faithful servant, probably been with him for a long time. It's his main, it's like the chief of, uh, over all of the other servants. He was a very good man, and he was good to Avram, and Avram was good to him. But he was only Avram's servant. There's a difference between the relationship of a servant and the relationship of a son. And God had promised that there would be a son, but God had not specified up to this point if that would be a literal out of his loins, uh, seed of his body, son, or whether it would be one who came into that sonship through that inheritance, um, through the law of Hammurabi. So here's where Abram's really get, getting down to it. Is Eliezer my offspring? My, my, I shouldn't say offspring, but my, the one to inherit. That's what he is wondering because he doesn't have one born in his house. And so, uh, and by the way, he's probably about 85 at this time. He'd probably given up the hope of children for quite a, a while. Sarah, his wife, is 75. You get that from verse, uh, chapter 17 and verse 17. And we find out that when Ishmael is born, because Sarah gets discouraged and gives her handmaiden to Avram, who does uh, produce seed in Hagar, and she does give birth to Ishmael, that chapter 16 and verse 16 tells us Avram was 86 at that point. We know that by the time Yitzhak is born, and I just gave you away the whole secret, he is going to have a son of his very own. Avram will be 100 and Sarah will be 90. How do we get that there's 10 years between their age? That's again scriptures that as we keep going, we will see, but in Genesis 16, 3, we're told that 10 years after they dwelt in Canaan, Avram was 75, um, and he was, he was 75 when he first entered the land. That's chapter 12 and verse 4. So when you put together these references, you get the age difference between them. You get all of that. If I've confused you, just look up the scriptures later that I gave you before. I'm trying to hurry and, and not just repeat last week's or, you know, the last time's lesson. So God is going to answer Avram. He had a right to ask. God's giving him face time in this vision. He's one on one with him. And then he says, then behold. And remember when we see behold in scripture, I want to wake you up and I want to say, behold, hello. <laughs> God's saying something important here. All his words are important, but let's behold what he says to Avram. Avram's just opened up and cushed out his heart and Lord, God, I'm so old. I'm dying off. I've got no offspring. Is this it? Is Eliezer to be my heir, the one that you've promised? Or is there something more? I see a hope in that picture. So the word of the Lord, here we have it again. The word of the Lord, Yeshua Jesus, came to him saying, 
This man will not be your heir. Eliezer, the servant, will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. So he's telling him that you are going to have a natural son, even though you're too old to father children. And we know that from Romans 4.19. Let's take a quick look. I think we did it last time, but Romans 4.19 lets us know that Abraham was past childbearing age, as was Sarah. In verse 19, we read, Without becoming weak in faith, he, Avram, contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Okay, he's 100, she's 90, her womb is long past producing a, a child, and him giving her the, the seed, it's, it's done, it's over. But it's not, because as we go back to Genesis, we have the miraculous come into play, and we know this is how birth was given. Yitzhak was conceived in a way that really shows life coming out of death. It shows the power of the resurrection. And spiritually, that's how we come into life also. We die, but then we're raised as sons of God. And we can't be a son of God until we are born again, until we come in through that resurrection life. So it's like a resurrection. So it's a perfect way to picture for us the whole gospel message that it's not by our power that we do anything. Avram could do nothing to produce a child. He'd had a hundred years and he hadn't produced it, not with Sarah, the two of them together at 90 and a hundred. It was totally a miraculous birth. And for us, anytime we come into that point of salvation where we give our lives over, we picture it in our baptism that we go under the water showing a death, come up out of the waters into newness of life, resurrection. We see that here also. This is a huge promise. Can you imagine Avram's excitement? He's still yet going to have one that's his very own with his number one wife because Hagar is his, it's the handmaid, not his wife. She's like a concubine, but uh, he's going to have this with Sarah. Now, God's just given him an amazing promise. And on the heels of that, he took him outside. Now, remember, this is in vision, but when Yochanan was on the Isle of Patmos, when we get the book of Revelation, we know there were times that he was ushered up into heaven to see a heavenly scene in the vision. We don't know whether that they literally leave this earth or is all in vision, whichever way it is, it's 100% real and 100% true. And God took Avram outside, outside of the tent I imagine, because that's where he stayed. And he took him out there because he had to show him something. What he wanted to show him, he couldn't see with a roof over his head. <laughs> so he took him out, and in verse 4, and I lost my place because I moved the tablet, sorry, uh, verse 5, that's my problem. He took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you are able to count them. I'll finish the whole verse and then we'll break it down. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Now, I've got to talk to both of those sentences. So let me take you back. Let's unpack this because this is a wow verse. Outside or in the Hebrew, well, the Hebrew is outside. You may have a broad. He took him out where he could see the stars of the heaven. Same stars that we see in our stars of the heaven today. I can't tell you exactly those stars because the heavens move, you know, so we don't know. But you get my point. But when we get into the Hebrew, we get so much more. When he told him to look toward the heavens and count the stars, he didn't say to him, okay, Avram, get your mouth going, put a telescope there, notice how many and how close they are, but start counting. <laughs> One, two, three, four, I imagine getting to, you know, 519. Oops, uh, was that, what count was I on? I, okay, I'll start again. One. Two. <laughs> it would have been an impossible task. What our Hebrew literally says is narrate, record, inscribe, enumerate, recount, make a list, declare. Any of those words are acceptable for this Hebrew word. When we use this same Hebrew word in Tehillim in Psalm 19.1, 
the word there is translated in our English declare. Psalm 19, 1 says the heavens, which is what Avram's looking at, the heavens declare the glory of God. Avram is given that same word, declare the stars, declare them, narrate them, count them. Now, we also get from Hebrew, we have a root, and we build words off of that root. The root word that these come off of, we get the word for a book and the word for a scribe. Scribe is safer, S-E-F-E-R, and I don't remember the word for book. I forgot to write it down, but both of these come off of this word. What we have here, and I, I don't, let me, I'll, I don't want to get out word. Let me tell you first, if we're writing a book, we're narrating what can be told, we're recounting, we're telling the story, it all fits. And a scribe would be one who is writing it down. So God's basically telling him, I'm telling you enough to write it in a book. I'm telling you, declare it. Let's write it down. Let's get this all the way to the end. You're my safer. You're the one to write right now. You're the one to, to get all of this. And then he tells them that what he's narrating, what he's recounting, what he's telling, what he is declaring, he says to him, so shall your descendants be. Now, in my New American Standard here, it has it in plural form. The Hebrew word is seed, and seed usually you would think is more than one. But when we take that very same word, when we go into the Berachat Hashah, into the New Covenant, we're going to go to Galatians. Galatians speaks to the same thing and makes something really concrete, clear, where we know how we're supposed to translate Genesis 15. And remember, we let Scripture help us understand Scripture. So take a quick journey with me over to Galatians chapter 3. Whoops, I just told my Bible to go to Romans. Sorry, I'll get there in a moment. Galatians chapter 3, and to give us just a, a tiny bit of background, we're going to look at verse 6. That'll give us our context because we want to keep in context. Then we're going to drop down to verse 16. So Galatians 3, 6 is telling us we're talking about the very same thing, the same time, the same person, everything. It says, even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now remember that sentence because we're going to see that in Genesis in just a, a couple of minutes. But I'm taking you here now so you see Abraham was telling, declaring what God was showing him in the stars, and he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Down to verse 16 gives us the other real important clue, which says, Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Remember, God just said to count, and so shall your seed be. And I said it, that could be plural, but it also can be singular. Look at how it's used in verse 16. The promises that were spoken to Abraham and to his seed, he, God, does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. So now we know really Genesis should have been translated descendant. It shouldn't have been descendants, although you can see both levels, and I'll go back and explain that in a moment. But before we leave here, I want to finish verse 16 because it's, it's so key. God didn't leave this up for grabs. He didn't leave it up for you to wonder what he's meaning. He spelled it out. And so we read in verse 16 um, as referring to, not as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Messiah. Your English says Christ. So how much more clear can it be? Avraham, look, you're going to have a descendant it's going to come from your own loins. This descendant, this seed, the one that matters is Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. That's what's going to come from your loins. You're not just going to have a son. You're going to be the great, 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 great to the son of God when he comes in human form. It's all tied together with a pretty little bow on top so that you cannot have anyone say, well, that isn't what he meant. If God didn't mean that it was referring to his son, to Yeshua, to the Messiah, then why did God say it? Because when he spells it out, I'm not going to put a question mark at the end of it. I'm going to put an exclamation point. 
So keep that in mind that we are talking specifically about a seed. Is it true that there's going to be many come from Abraham? Yes, because Abraham isn't going to give birth to the Messiah. He's going to give birth to Yitzhak, who's going to give birth to Yaakov, who's going to give birth to, and we could go on down if I just hit highlights, Jesse, David, Finally, we come into the, the genealogy given in Matthew that brings it right down to Miriam and Yosef giving birth to the one called Emmanuel, God with us, the one called um, Yeshua, Jesus, because he will save his people from the sins, their sins. The one that I said, and I hope you had a month of seeing the wonder of it all, and the wonder is Yeshua himself, who is wonderful and wonderful counselor. All of this is summed up in this one seed. With your mind wanting to explode, I hope, let me take you back real quick to Genesis and let's see the fullness of this meaning because we've just begun and I love it. Back in Genesis, in Bereshit, where we have it here, then we could say, so shall your descendant be. Now, I'm not going to tell you your Bible's wrong because it says descendants because that's true also. What I see is two levels going on. Often in scripture, there's there's so much meaning. It's, I call it pregnant with meaning. You can have twins when you're pregnant sometimes, sometimes multiple even more than that. But my thought, my what I want to get across to you is scripture has so much depth. If you try to make it only mean one thing on one level, you're going to miss many other levels. That's why people can look at scripture from different viewpoints with their backgrounds and their knowledge and glean other things out of a verse and share it with you and you can go wow I never saw that but I do see that in scripture and as long as it scripture stays with scripture and doesn't ever scripture will never argue with itself is what I'm trying to say as long as what is being presented is scriptural then then look at the fullness of the meaning so there's so much more here yes he's going to have a large family the seeds are going to come from it but there's one in particular that matters. You are going to, to be blessed, Avram, to be the, the great, great of the seed that it has been promised. Remember the seed all the way back in Genesis chapter 3? That there would be the seed of the woman that would crush the head of the enemy, the head of the serpent. He would crush his heel which we see in the crucifixion, the hill where the, the human body touched the earth, but even in that, which is not a death blow, if your heel gets crushed, no, it's the hurt of the crucifixion, yet he would crush the head of the serpent under his foot, under that heel that Satan tried to, to, to crush, and he would destroy the enemy forever. Hallelujah, that's what's coming. So. Keeping that all in mind, back in here, we are looking at, at what he is seeing because he's narrating the stars. How can he narrate stars? How do the stars tell the story? Well, for those of you who have been with me in another study, you know that there is a study called the Gospel in the Stars. And it very easily could be that this is what God was showing Avram that he was showing him the constellations, the forms of the constellations, and explaining them to him so that he would have the whole plan. If he was doing that, he was explaining to him Virgo. Now, remember, we hear these names used in astrology today because what does Satan do? Counterfeit. Takes some truth and adds his lie, his spin to it. We don't go with Satan, we don't go with astrology, we throw all of that out in the pit where it belongs, but we can look at the pure astronomy, the stars themselves that God created, and we can see in these constellations, in their names, in their descriptions, we saw that the plan of salvation comes from Virgo, the Virgin. We saw that that referred to Genesis 3.15, the, the uh, Messianic prophecy that I just gave you a few moments ago. He could have taken him all the way from Virgo to Leo. Leo's the lion. We see the lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation 5.5, 5, who is victor. The lamb who was slain is now the lion of the tribe of Judah, the kingly tribe from which Messiah would come. So I think God, taking his time in this vision, was showing Avram the virgin birth, 
the fact that why there had to be virgin birth so that Messiah could save his people because he would be sinless showed it all the way through to his kingship, to his ruling. Well, he could have taught to him about Centaurus that speaks of the sin offering or Bootes, the coming one. And we saw that that's one coming. We see it in two times to take care of sin and to come as victor. He could have taught to him about Libra where we saw the cross and the crown. How about Scorpio, where we saw the serpent struggling with the man? And in Sagittarius, the two nature conquer, fully God, fully man. We saw it in the two natures of Sagittarius. And Sagittarius just happens to be the one who casts the serpent called Draco from heaven. And we know Satan does get cast out of heaven. Taurus represents Messiah's coming to rule. Gemini, again, the twofold nature of the king, fully human and fully divine. And we suddenly begin to see what God could have been revealing to Abraham. Now, it's estimated there are 100 billion stars in our universe alone. 200 billion, trillion, or 200 and sextillion, we're told, in the universe beyond. Milky Way has 100 billion. In the universe beyond, 200 billion, trillion. I can't even think that high is seven sets of three zeros that follow 200 so you've got 200 and then you draw seven sets of three zeros that's how many stars just in our universe if you take just in our Milky Way they say there's a hundred billion I see what God says about the stars and let me show you what else he says because again this isn't theory this comes out of the scriptures so remember how I brought to you Psalm Tehillim 19:1. Go with me there, because we're going to go to the next few verses. Whoops, what did I hit wrong? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm challenged today. Come on, tablet. We're going to go to Psalm 19, 1, if I can get my tablet to come up. There we go. Okay, and I'll be there in just a moment. Sorry, folks. I get so excited I can't do this earthly stuff. <laughs> Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare, or the heavens are telling, of the glory of God. Same word that we have in Genesis. And it goes on, it says, their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. As we see the expanse of heaven, the heavens, we're seeing what God did with his handiwork, that he created it all. But notice what he says about the heavens he created. He says in verse two, day to day pours forth speech. That's language, that's words. Night to night reveals knowledge. Now, if I look up at this cloud, the stars tonight, if it's not cloudy and I see a bunch of stars, is that going to give me a lot of knowledge? No. But if I study the stars, the true study, the astronomy of our God, and I start seeing some of the, those constellations that I just mentioned that are declaring all these different aspects of Messiah's life, that's beginning to fill me with knowledge, the knowledge of the Word of God. Oh, of the Word. Who is the word? Yeshua. What are the stars declaring? The glory of God. Hold on to that because we're also going to see, well, in fact, I'll take you right there so I don't forget. Hold on to Psalm 19 because we will come back there. But go real quick to Hebrews 3 because if the heavens are declaring the glory of God, what's the glory of God? I'm going to give it to you from Hebrews, from God's own word. I'm going to start with verse 1, Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, but it's verse 3 that's key for what I want to bring out. One one tells us God has spoken long ago to the fathers. Abraham is the, one of the forefathers, and he spoke in the prophets. We know that's Elijah, and that's that's um, Zechariah, and that that's oh my goodness, I'm, you can think of prophets, okay? In many portions, in many ways. So through time, before there were prophets, God spoke to the fathers. Who were the fathers? Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Get past their time, get into the time when you've got all of these prophets. And we've got Daniel, and Hosea, and Joel, and my mind's finally coming alive. There are so many prophets. God spoke through them in many portions, gave many scriptures that we see him reveal his plan to us in many different ways. In the last days, he has spoken to us in his son. Yeshua is the great declaration of God's speech. That's why he's called the word. 
because he's the word of God and the word went forth and we know that's all the way back from the beginning because Yochanan John 1 tells us in the beginning the word was with God and the word was God. So this son that is being declared, that is the speech, that is the voice, the words of our God who has been declared to us through our fathers, through our prophets, many ways and many times, finally has been all summed up in this one that is his son. Verse 2, whom he appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. Do we not see that in scripture? We've gone through a study of this before where we know that in the beginning God's created. Elohim and Yeshua, both were visible in their actions in creation. I don't mean visible in the eyes, but from what we read in the Hebrew and the spirit in verse 2, moving over the face of the earth, you have the triunity of God involved in the creation. So it's a true statement here that through him, through Yeshua, all this world was created. And yet at the same time, when he became the son, the son of man comes into human form. He ends up being the one who is the heir of all things. Remember, Avram wants to pass down everything to his son, who's going to come out of his very own loins. God didn't create Yeshua. He is equal and always with God. Remember Isaiah um, 9, 6 tells us the child is born, the son is gifted, the son is given, the son was always there, but the son as a son can be heir. So Yeshua is going to be heir to this whole world that God says, sit here at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool and then everything will be subject under your feet. It will all belong to you in your sonship role as well as it's yours because you are the creator of it. Do you get that? I hope not. Because if you do, you got a better mind than I, and that's not what I mind, but you've got a mind equal to God's if you're fully understanding this, and none of us can. That we can begin to grasp, that we can begin to get a little glimpse, we can begin to see, but wow, how, how is he creator and heir at the same time? Mind-boggling, mind-blowing, I love it. I'm thrilled to see the majesty of my God, and yet I haven't hit my highlight yet. So let me go into verse 3. Verse 3 of Hebrews 1 says, And he, the Son, the Son of God, the one that God has spoken through, and we know especially in the, in the book of Yochanan John, it's repeatedly said that, that Yeshua came to speak the words of the Father, came to do the works of the Father. We see that relationship. And here in verse 3 he says, He, the Son, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, of the nature of God, and upholds all things by the word of his power. This one who has created it all, who's sustaining all, keeping it all, this one is the express radiant image of, the, of God. So you want to know what God looks like? Look at Yeshua. You want to know what Yeshua looks like? Look at the face of God. They are so interchangeable where we're given description. You can start and say, oh, well, we're talking Jehovah, but before you're done, you'll say we're talking the Son, and vice versa. You'll see that in Daniel. you see that in Revelation chapter 1. There's so many places that it is so hard to separate them because they are one. And what we're seeing is an express, exact image. This is more than a mirror reflection. Mirror reflection, even though it looks perfect to us, is not. But this is the exact exact representation as if he is and that's my whole point he is God and he is the son at the same time and he is called here the radiance of his glory so if you want to see God's glory you want to see that Shekhinah glory in a way that you can begin to understand it why does it say glory oh wait a minute I heard that all the way back in Psalm in Tehillim 19 and verse 1 the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, Hebrews 1, 3 just told me the glory of God is Yeshua. So what's the heavens declaring? Yeshua. He's all over the original scriptures. That's why we tell you it is one continuous book. This is Messiah in the original covenant, which you guys call the old. Go back to it. Go back to, to uh, J J uh, Psalm 19. And then we see how if the heavens are declaring the glory of God, the heavens are declaring Yeshua Jesus, then what we should be seeing in the heavens, it tells us about Yeshua Jesus. 
well, what did I just take you through? I just took you through several of the constellations and we saw his virgin birth. We saw his twofold nature. We saw him as the lion who conquers. We saw him as the one who is coming. Do you not see in the stars alone his first coming and his second coming all foretold? This is what Abraham would have been seeing. He would have been being given a narration of the life, if I can call it that, the life of Yeshua in the flesh, but the life of the, the Godhead of Yeshua as God. He would have been seeing and being told this, this God is going to put on human form. Now think about it. We look back. We get all the stories, especially if we grow up with this. And sometimes I think that does us a disservice because we lose grasping hold of the reality of it. Can you imagine Avram being told, God, Yehovah, the self-existing one, the creator, the sustainer, he is going to become like you, Avram. He's going to come out of your loins. He's going to put on skin. He's going to be confined to a body. He's going to come into space and time. Yes, he's the creator of it all, and he's above it all, and he's beyond it all, and he's not held by it, and yet he's going to choose in a form to come in, and he's going to come through your seed. Wow. <laughs> Don't you love my adult vocabulary? But there's nothing better than that word, wow, in my opinion, when you hit these points. And here we have, as we go on, there is, okay, day-to-day -day poor speech, night-to-night -night reveals knowledge, the knowledge of our God in, in the Son. Verse 3, there is no speech. There are no words. Is he just going against what he just said? No. What he's saying is it's not written like you write here on earth. That's not what he's saying. It's not speaking like I'm speaking right now. You don't hear the stars say, this is my name, and this is what I mean, and this is what I do, and it's all written out so that Avram's reading it. No, but it's declaring it. It's speaking it. It's telling it that even though it's not speech and words, and it's not a voice that's heard, their line, their story, that what they're telling you has gone out through all the earth and the utterances to the end of the world. In them, he's even placed a tent for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And I see that take us now all the way to our bridegroom coming back in glory, the glory brighter than the sun, stopping the enemies and setting up his kingdom here on earth. It's all given in the gospel and the stars from his virgin birth to his second coming in glory. Wow, I get so excited over this. This is just so cool. And it says it's from the circuit. Uh, it's okay. Let me just start in here again. In, in verse five, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, it rejoices as a strong man to run his course. The strong man finishes the course. He he doesn't stop mid race. He finishes it all the way to the end. It's the rising from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. In other words, God says, "Here's the complete story. Let me give you the whole enchilada, Abram. Let me give you everything from the beginning." to the end. And then we know that it goes beyond that because we go into eternity future, yet we don't know what that is yet. God hasn't revealed that yet. We'll know that when we get there. And we'll have all of eternity to explore it and learn from it and glorify our God in it. Because wow, if this is something, and if the skies are something, and I can't wait to see those constellations. I can't wait to, to fly past what's glorifying my God. And we have other scriptures that tell us also, and I'm looking for where they are right now, but the one that comes to mind, and I'll look it up for you later, is in the Psalms that it says that the stars are singing. They do have a voice. It's just a different type of voice, but they're singing. They're singing glory to their God. And we have also in scripture verses that fit with Psalm 19, 5 and 6 right here. We have in, Psalm, well, let's look, Psalm 147, 4, and I'll probably find the verse I want while I'm along in that also. Psalm 147 and verse 4 says, he counts the number of stars, okay? He declares the number of stars, and he gives names to all of them. When we studied the stars, we saw that they had names, and those names 
told us something. That name was for a reason why it was called that. So the stars have names, and God's the one who named them. Go with me to Isaiah, Yeshaya, prophet Isaiah in chapter 40 and verse 26. Isaiah 40 and verse 26. And in verse 26 we read, Lift up your eyes on high. See who has created these stars. The one who leads forth their hosts by number. He calls them all by name because of the greatness of his might, the strength of his power. Not one of them is missing. Isn't that a hallelujah? He dots his eyes. He crosses his T's. It's not, oops, there goes a star. What am I going to do? i got a hole here right now. I picture someone knitting, and, and if they make a mistake and they don't do something right, there's that little, and they have to go back and fix it. God never has to fix anything. He does it right the first time, and he holds it, and he keeps it. And every single little star has a purpose. It has a name. It has a reason for being there, and it gets to just hang out and glorify God. Hallelujah. I'm glad we get to do more than just hang out. We get to learn and study, and we get to be in the presence of our God serving Him. I mean, we, we get more than what the stars get, but I, I'm not going to sell them short. Let me show you some of these constellations and meanings. Go with me to Yaov. That's the book of Job. Job lived probably about the same time as Avram. So even though you find his book halfway through your original covenant, realize he lived back either predated or right at the time of Avram. I tend to think he was even just slightly ahead. Chapter 26 and verse 13, God's saying here in his book to Yahweh, by his, by God's breath, the heavens are cleared. His hand has pierced the fleeing serpent. Do you remember when you studied with me the gospel and the stars, the serpent, Draco, that was fleeing? Here's who's causing him to flee. God's pierced him, and he's fleeing. We have that his, his breath is in the heavens, and we saw that in the heavens. Now go to chapter 38 of Job, of Job chapter 38, and we're going to look at verses 31 and 32. And here we read in those verses, can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? We know those are names of constellations. We recognize those today. Then verse 32, can you, Yov, Job, can you lead forth a constellation in its season? Remember, seasons are for times and for purposes. They're to be declaring something. Can you lead forth a constellation in its season? Guide the bear with her satellites. Now, we know the bear is another constellation. Can you, yo, Job, can you cause them to do what they're doing? Can you declare to them what to do? Can you make them do these things? And we know, of course, he cannot. The only one who can is God. And does that not blow your mind all the more? And just to give you a sneak taste of it, because we're so close to the time when we're thinking about it, if you recall the story of Yeshua and his birth, and you go a little past his birth, don't make the mistake and have the wise men at the manger scene, at the stable, because they weren't there. But these wise men, these men who studied the stars, these men who came from the east, and if you remember, Daniel was sent to the east, Daniel. Daniel educated the wise men. They were supposed to educate him and his wisdom outshine theirs because his wisdom was from God. And I believe from Daniel teaching them, they held on to what he told. I believe he taught them of the coming of Mashiach. And there was in the, the telling about the star that would be his star. Why is it called his star? Because it belonged to him to tell about him. His star shining would tell them that the child had been born. That's what sent the kings from the east on their journey. And it wasn't just three, and they didn't get there overnight. It took them a while to get there. And long story short, they follow his star all the way to Bethlehem, to Bethlehem, to the house 
where the young child, the toddler probably, well, we know because he had it been under two, because when Herod tries to get rid of him, he, he kills all the babies from two and under. But that's how they knew to follow because they knew the star, the star in the sky that was according to what they had been taught the same way that when the virgin was on the meridian and her breast was was pierced with that line, it was showing that she was now nursing the child. We don't know everything about that star, but we know enough to be absolutely standing in amazement. God put that star in the sky where the men in the east would see it to know now the king has been born. Because remember, they came asking Herod, where is the king born, the, 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 the king of the Jews? Where is he? We know he's been born, for we've seen his star. If you don't want to believe it from Avram, then what are the wise men talking about? And how did they know? And how did they know where to come? And how did they know? Well, and they still didn't. They didn't even realize. But the gifts they gave to foreshadow his life, the whole thing, you, you see it. You see it in every bit of scripture that touches on it, from Genesis to the Psalms to the Gospels to Hebrews and to Revelation completing it. From beginning to end, it's there. Our stars are declaring. They are telling. The gospel message is there. So this is what Avram saw. As I take you back now into Genesis 15, we go back with, with our minds again, exploding all the more all over us. Lord, help us be able to absorb this. This is what God showed him. Taking you back to verse 5 again, look toward the heavens, narrate the stars. If you're able to tell, if you're able to declare, and he said to them, so shall your descendant the one who the, the, the wise men followed his stars, your descendant, Yeshua, that Galatians told us is none other than Mashiach, Messiah, Christ himself. That's who will come from you. Yes, you will also have many children, but this is the all this this is the one that matters. You know, everyone wanted to be in that line, the Messiah. The women who were at the time of Yeshua's birth. We're all hoping to be the one who would give birth to the Messiah. That would be a big deal. If you can imagine their excitement, would God choose me? Would he choose my family? Well, we know he chose the family of David. We know that the line had to follow. We know it had to come from the tribe of Judah. We have all those fingerprints, over 300 fingerprints of who he had to be, where he had to be born, who he was born to, all of that. God showed Avram. That wasn't a plan God was developing. That wasn't something that God figured it out as he went down the line. That wasn't putting pieces of the puzzle together and hoping to get a picture in the end. God said, before the foundations of the earth, I have declared. And then he put it into the, the stars in the sky because that was something he could communicate with to earth to know the story. This also shows me why I believe fully that you cannot say, well, God's a mean God. People who are born in the jungles never have a chance to hear about, about Christ, and they end up going to hell. They didn't have a chance. That's not a fair God. And I say, no, 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 no. As the scriptures say, even the creation speaks of the master designer, the one who does have the plan. And if they come to that light, hey, who created this beauty that I see? This couldn't just happen. Then God will give them more light. And the more light that he gives them brings them to the truth. If they abide by it and open themselves up to the truth, the same way Abraham is being shown the truth right now, then they get salvation. That's a reward. It's not that they have to be educated in the United States. They have to go to a church on a corner. They have to be able to, to spell it out in all its detail. The gospel is simple enough for a little child to understand it. And God is not willing that any should perish. So he finds ways to communicate. Remember Hebrews in from the fathers to the prophets in many ways, in many portions, in many different ways. And I've told you the story before, in short, of the one who in his tribe they they created, they carved the idols that they worshiped. And he wondered as he was growing up, he was the, the son it was being passed down to. If my hand can create this idol, my hand is stronger than this idol. Who created my hand? That's the God I want to worship. That's the God I want to know. Grows up, goes to village market on his way back, hears 
the tribe that was near their tribe, having a missionary there telling the story, the one who created them. And as soon as he heard it, his heart just exploded. That's the God I wanted to know. That's the God who created me. He stayed, he heard, he got the gospel message. He invited the Lord into his heart. He went back to his tribe and brought the gospel message there also. Hallelujah, that's my God. Doesn't matter where you're born, when you're born, no excuse. God has made it under the heavens declaring his glory declaring Yeshua Jesus. So Avram, as he's seeing all of this, as we go back into this and we see that, that and by the way, let me also remind you, he, he himself, Yeshua Jesus, is called the bright and morning star in Revelation twenty two sixteen. There's his star. That's what they saw, I believe. But anyway, back to, to verse 6 here. How did Avram react to this? He has been given so much knowledge. He's been told so much. What was his reaction? And I love it. Then he believed in the Lord. Hebrews says he trusted in the Lord. He believed in the, the Lord who was the quickener of the dead, the one who would out of his dead body bring him that promised seed, that one that we look to all the way in Galatians 3.16. He believed God. He believed it because faith in Messiah is what justifies you. We see the result here. Then he believed in the Lord, and the result, he, God, reckoned it to him as righteousness. In other words, on the basis of what Avram believed, God declared Avram righteous. And I'll ask you, when believing you're going to be a big family, does that make somebody righteous? And the answer is never, never. Was it true that he was telling Avraham, you will have a big family? Yes. He addresses that again also. We're going to see that his family would be as much as the dust on the earth, as much as the stars in the sky. But he's bringing him out of all that's going to come from you. Here's the one that matters. Let me reveal to you what the whole heavens are declaring. And Avram got so excited that he believed it, that he took it, God at his word. And I say it that way on purpose. He took God at Yeshua. That's why when we get into uh, Yochanan, into John chapter 8, and the Pharisees are trying to say that Yeshua is not God. And people who say that, that he didn't declare that he was God, oh, hello, read the book of John. He declared time and again he was God, sent from God, but was God, doing the work of God, doing it all. And Yeshua said to, to the Pharisees there, he said, Abraham saw my day and rejoiced. Well, the Pharisees called him out and said, Avraham saw your day? You're not even 50 years old. Avraham's thousands of years before us. How can you say Avraham saw your day? Was Avraham resurrected from the dead and standing there in the time of the first century, those first 30 plus years? Is that what we're being told? And of course not. You don't read anywhere that Avram was resurrected, dropped into Bethlehem or to Nazareth or to Jerusalem to see Jesus in his work. But did Avram see the day that Yeshua would be born? Did he see the crucifixion? <clears throat> did he see the resurrection out of the dead? He knows that God's saying, out of your dead body, I'm going to bring life. And we know that he created all life. So what was it to him to resurrect the Son of God? Did Avraham see that day, the day that Yeshua himself came for? All the rest, blow it away. Don't miss that. That was the whole reason why he came. He came to die. He came to conquer death because in his death and his burial and his resurrection, he conquered the power of sin. He wiped out sin. He wiped out the consequences of sin, which is death. He procured eternal life for every single one who will believe. And he could do it because his <clears throat> blood was sinless. He did not die for himself. He could put it on the mercy seat in heaven and open up the heavens. That's what Avram saw. And Avram believed. And God said, you're declared righteous. 
you're declared as if it has happened, Avram, because you have faith in what I've shown you, you believe. That's what made Avraham righteous. I'm going to get your question in just a second, Rhonda. I do see your hand. Let me give you a couple scriptures quick, and then we'll go to, to any and all questions. Go with me right now real fast to Acts 4.12. In fact, I can say it to you. There is no other name under heaven whereby one man can be saved. Okay? It's Yeshua Jesus is the only way for salvation. That's Acts 4.12. I'm going to take you there anyway because I want to make sure I quoted it accurately. And then we're going to go to um, chapter 13 in Acts also. Acts 4.12, I started it well. There is, no, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that's been given among men by which we must be saved. Keep that in your mind and go to chapter 13 of Acts. Chapter 13 of Acts and chapter 13, verses 38 and 39, where we read, Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him, Yeshua Jesus, forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. There's no other way to be freed from sin and the power of sin, which is death, but through the name Yeshua Jesus. This also, when it says in, in Genesis 15 that Abraham believed, it's the first time we have the word believed in Scripture also. Remember, those firsts are, are critically important. The first time that we're given that word, and the root word of believe in Hebrew is aman, A-M-A-N. -A -M. Where do you think we get amen? Right off of this root word. Abraham believed. You know what Abraham said? Amen. I declare it. The heavens declare, and I believe it. I put my amen on it. Not that that means it makes it true, but he was confirming in his spirit. It's, it's a supporting of what God said. He was agreeing with, with God. His faith was in the risen Messiah. Let me take you in conclusion and then right to Rhonda first and then anyone else after Romans 10, 9 and 10. Romans 10, because this is fundamental to our faith, folks. This, this is where it's all at. If this crumbles, forget it. We've lost it all. There, there's no way it ever will. It is fully truth. Verse 9 of chapter 10, if you confess with your mouth, Yeshua, Jesus, as Adonai, as Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It doesn't say there if you do works, if you believe this and then go out and act, if you do this and do anything else, it's if you do this, if you believe in your heart, you're saying it with your mouth, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. So if Abraham became righteous, it was with his heart. It was with his mouth confessing what his heart was believing. With the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. How did Abraham become righteous? confessing with his mouth what he believed in his heart. He saw Yeshua's day. He knew here is the gift of salvation, the one who will be my seed. And we'll finish it off with John 8, 56 to 58. I keep promising Rhonda, but I want to get my whole thought out so I don't lose it. John 8, 58 to 56. I'm sorry, 56 to 58, where we read, Come on, hurry, hurry, hurry. There we go. Where we read. Okay, I already told you about this. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews, the Pharisees that were around him, they said to him, you're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? And Yeshua Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am the eternal self-existing God who is revealing himself. And they got it. He didn't, you don't think he claimed to be God? Then how come verse 59 says they picked up stones to throw at him? They wanted to stone him to death. That's what you did to one who was blasphemous. He declared himself to be God. They said anyone who declares himself to be God is blasphemous. And so they took up stones. They wanted to stone him, but he withdrew and he disappeared from their midst. He declared he was God. 
He showed Abraham, God, the self-existent one, Yehovah showed Adonai, showed Adonai Yehovah, showed all of this. Abraham saw his day. Abraham believed in it, and that's what made Abraham righteous, not having a big family. That's a sideline. That's another purpose of these verses to show us, but it's out of that first birth that's miraculous, out of a dead body and a dead womb, God was going to bring life, and it was a picture foretelling the life that would come, virgin-born, miraculous, that would give us life today. Hallelujah. Abraham saw it all. You know what I want to do when I'm in heaven? I want to stand somewhere in space, and I want to say, God, can you show me what you showed Abraham? I just, I just want to go through it with you. I just want you to be my teacher, and I want to see it from your view. I don't think there's any reason why he won't do that with me. And if you want to join, come on. There's plenty of room. We've got a great expanse to just hang around and glorify our God as the heavens declare the glory of God. Hallelujah. Rhonda, I've got to give it to you. Where are you? Where's your question? I lost you. There you are. <laughs> Can she unmute? Roger's getting you too. Okay, Rhonda. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of, I had to say it out loud and make sure I'm hearing you the way you're saying it. And would it be proper to say that the when we study the gospel and the stars, and when we saw all the different constellations of all the different, you know, astronomy signs, um, that that's what Abraham was being shown. And so that's why we say that we, he saw the first coming and the second coming. And in, the, in that point in time, he always knew that Jesus was going to be the Savior and that was gonna, it wasn't going to be the law. Uh, he, he just saw it all. And so um, that's what it's all about. And I, I guess I just never really, you never really get that. At least I haven't gotten that in church. But it's just like, I wish that had been communicated that that's what that's all about. That he pointed to the stars. He saw all the different constellations and what they were speaking of. And it doesn't mean counting. It means, it can mean counting in the num numerous number of descendants. But it means there's a story out there. There's a story Absolutely. out there. You got it, hook, line, yeah. and sinker. It's the, I can't say the gospel in a nutshell because it's the whole right. heavens to right. declare it, but here was the whole gospel message. The mm -hmm. whole message was there, and even more than the gospel too because he saw first coming, he saw second coming, he saw God's plan of the ages. I'll put it that way. God's plan of the ages was revealed to Abraham, but what was critical was the seed. He saw Yeshua's day. And he rejoiced. He said, basically, hallelujah, there's my salvation. And looking toward it is how all got saved before the Lord came. They did when it came into, um, into law. They did the sacrificial system to show that they believed. This lamb was to be a picture of the perfect lamb of God. But this predates that. This is before there was law. This is before any of that was given. This is just strictly the promise, the time of promise. God promised Abraham. And in that promise, God showed him it all. He believed, and it made him, in God's view, righteous because he and, and we're going to get into what that means um if we don't have too many questions we'll get into it right now because it's credited it's counted to him for righteousness but that's how we're saved it's by faith in yeshua the son of god who gave his life for the world it's not in our works it's not in our law it's not in our anything is he did it all and abraham got to just Mm -hmm. See a great movie. <laughs> I don't know exactly how, but wow, wow, wow. Rowena, yes, jump in here. Unmute yourself and jump in here. And I see the excitement on faces. It, it is. It's amazing. Our God is awesome. If he could create it all out of nothing, how could he not put it in the stars? That was nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, when he threw the stars out, they, it was his finger work. It, wasn't, it didn't even take a muscle. <laughs> He just, yeah. bing, 
<laughs> they declared. Rowena, go ahead. I'm sorry. I need to zip my lips. <laughs> Roger, can you help her? She, Rowena wants to say something. Try again. Okay. There we go. I, I, yeah, I just wanted to share with the class that since that lesson, and I understood what Abraham saw that made him believe, and then he, it was credited to him as righteousness, I was no longer afraid to look at the stars. Oh. I wanted to share that because that was one of the things I repented from when I became a believer because I read horoscopes. Ah, oh, okay. I'm doing that, but after I understood what the 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 stars were declaring, now I'm no longer to look afraid to look at the stars, and I even wondered, like, could you just give me a fast review of all that one? <laughs> <laughs> amen, amen. And as she said, here clearly, we have nothing to do with horoscopes. That's Satan. That's his lie. Throw it, burn it. Bury it. Do whatever to get it as far away from you as you can. But don't miss. Don't let what God put there be taken from you. God's truth is there. The same way I'll say, without getting off on the tangent, I'm coming right to you next. I will not give up the rainbow to those who are misusing it today. It also is declared in Scripture to be God's gift. And when he made it special in my life, I will still declare the rainbow is the glory of God. And it declares and tells his story. Even in the rainbow, it tells it all too. In that same way, don't lose the, the declaration of the stars because Satan put a counterfeit spin on it. But don't get anywhere near his counterfeit. Yes, Dora. It must have taken a special kind of person to um, absorb all that he saw. Absolutely. I mean, you blow your mind say, it, I mean, how can it happen? Absolutely, absolutely. Avram's been being grown all along. We've seen that. He's been being developed in his following God and his seeing, you know, how he needs to trust in God. Remember, you know, when he didn't trust and, and he gets Sarah in trouble because of that. He's been being grown to bring him to this point. God didn't bring him to it from day one when he called him to come out of idolatry. He worked with him, and he worked with him. And Avram must have had a brilliant mind. You know, we know he was good in business. He was good in everything that, that he did. But he must have had a brilliant mind. And I still think that he probably stood there with his mouth dropped open trying to comprehend it all. The same as I feel Yochanan John when he was being shown all we have in the Revelation. Because how does a first century person understand war of, of 21st century equipment? You know, he'd never seen a, a car, let alone an airplane, let alone rocket ships, let alone, you know, the, all this done with satellites. And I mean, it even blows our mind when we see some of what's going on right now. Yes, I think Abraham was absolutely mind blown. But I think God enabled his mind to grasp what was needed because we know the end result was he believed. First time we get the word, he believed. And that's exciting too. Any other comments? Yes, Maria. You help, help, help her too, Roger, Maria? For whatever reason, it's not letting you unmute until he does it. There, yeah. There you go. You, you know, and, and I think that's exactly what happens to each and every one of us. That we hear the gospel, but we don't believe it. But when we, we believe it, uh, we, uh, we enable God, even though God is, it has all the power. But what I'm saying is because he is such a respectful God. He gives that, us faith to believe. I'm not going to say we enable him. I know well, what you're trying to say. But no, but what I'm saying is because he cannot work in my heart if I don't, uh, if I don't allow him to. Because I have to be open. Right. So he, there is when the Holy Spirit works in me. Yes. Because yes. I believe, if I believe, I will allow. Yes. You know, and, the and word to work in me. Us opening our heart door. You know, we, mm -hmm. we have to open the door. It's like the, the picture which shows a, a two sides of the door. On the inside has the doorknob. On the outside doesn't. And God's knocking on that door. You know, he, you, we do have to open it. But that's all we do. And it's not that 
we did something good first. God loved no. us while we no, were no, yet no. sinners. God it initiated it. God did it all. God drew you. God God revealed it to you and drew you. But yes, God is a gentleman. He doesn't ever say, you have to believe. Swallow that. No, no, no. no. Because that will be against to who he is. Right, right. And he yeah. does not, if, if you do not want to love him, you do not want to choose him, then he will let you suffer the consequences of that decision that mm -hmm. it breaks his heart. And I think that's why, you know, he was uh, working with, of course, he already knew um, Abraham's heart, but he knew yes. that he had to work with him in order for him to believe. Yes. And that, that he was showing him all the stars, and then it just, it just came, everything came on Abraham and said, yeah. Wow, I believe just like any of us do that day that it all comes together and we accept. For many yeah. people, yeah. It, it is a process. They've heard and they've heard and they've heard, and it's like suddenly the light goes on and they receive. Yes, yeah. yes. And and we know. May I share also? Absolutely. I'm not sure who you are, but please. Does do. those, this is Josie. I'm sorry I'm late. That's but okay. I've been hearing it. I've been hearing it, and it's ironic that. Last night, I was talking to someone, and she was telling me, how do you know where you're going? Or how do you know where your husband is at? I say, God say, believe in me. You have to have faith and believe. I am really surprised of people now that still go to church. And this woman go to church. She's my age. And she still don't believe that she, that she thinks she's not going to go to heaven. She says she don't know until that day comes. Well, we pray for her salvation even right now because you are so right, Dosi. And you hit the nail on the head. A lot of people think they're Christians, and I put it in quotes because they go to church. Yes. If you were born in a yes. garage, does it make you a car? No. <laughs> Just because you go sit in a pew in a building, it does not make you a follower of Yeshua, Amen. a follower of Amen. Christ. It, it is Amen. a personal decision. And yes, I am sure Auburn's mind was exploding all over it. I just think God had a, there had been a lot of joy for God to show yeah. him his creation because God made this creation for us to enjoy, you know, for us yeah. to, to learn from and to enjoy and to see him and to learn of him also because we learn so much of who he is through what he created and how we are, you know, in relation with it. I think God had gotten a kick out of it. Just like when you're excited to share something with someone you love and you know what it's going yeah. to do for them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Amen. Thank yeah. you. What, what a time. What a time we and Messa had together. Wow. Amen. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Okay. Then I want to at least finish up this area. I think we might end up stopping on this area. I think I had, I had made this, uh, this comment before, but I think it's always uh, nice to, uh, to hear is when Adrian Rogers, you know, I know that you, you used to like his preaching as well as I did. <clears throat> and he says, you know, when, when we hear the, the, when we finally believe and hear the word of God, he says, it, we have this treasure. So it's like a woman, he said, this woman uh, was given a million dollars. This was in 1950. So you can imagine a million dollars in those years. And, and even, I, it, well, it must have been even before then because they didn't have, um, you know, the telephones. You have to call the operator for the operator to, to contact you or, or whomever you want to talk to. And the operator says, I want to talk to somebody because she wanted to tell people but she has gotten this, a mil, this million dollars. And she says, who do you want me to contact you with? Anybody. So, <laughs> So that's the same thing with us when we are so excited. We just want to to tell anybody and, and because please, we're so excited. Yeah, please let that build up in you again right now. Be so excited. Take it out. Share it because there's people right outside your door who are dying. People like Dosi ran into who are not yet believers. And yes, we need to be so excited. We need to be sharing this. This is the best news. How can you not want to share something so great? Look at if you believe in this, 
this is what it gains for you. You know, there's no downside to this. No mm -hmm. downside at all. It, it's the greatest. It makes life better here, and it gives the best for all of eternity. So absolutely, get excited. Take it out. Share it. Shout it. Wow. Wow. The heavens declare the glory of God. Never will be quite the same again, will it? Um, okay, I've given you all of that. I think I'm ready for that second part in, um, I think we're still in verse 6. Uh, yes, okay, then he believed. We've talked about belief in the Lord, and this is what God did. He reckoned it to him as righteousness. Reckoned, it can mean, actually does mean credited or um, counted it to him. It's the first mention in Scripture of this being applied to Avram's account. That is not anything Avram did, it's God applying it to Avram. And that's the difference. Everything else is by works. For by grace are we saved through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's what we're seeing. God gifted, God imputed, God put onto Avram this righteousness that we read about. And the word in, in Hebrew, again, to be reckoned as righteous, that word reckoned from the Hebrew is kasha. And again, it means to think or to account, to calculate, to count. I think God was doing a double play on counting the stars and it being calculated to Avram's account. I see all the math majors, their, their minds lighting up as, as all the, the terminology comes together and you see it. But what you need to see and understand is God applied it to Avram. God did it all. This is also the first mention of the word righteousness here. The first time we've got believed, the first time we have uh, credited or uh, counted in that way, and the first time we have righteousness mentioned. So again, let's take a quick look at that word righteousness. Go with me real quickly. We won't take as long. You've got the, the huge lesson. Now we're just adding the garnishes on top. Uh, Romans 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> what then shall we say? And we're in the same, I bring you here because we're talking about Avram again. What then shall we say that Avram, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Avram was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Now, here's the question. Because if you're going to say that Avram worked for his salvation, he did something. That's what the question's being raised here. According to the flesh. He did something. Is that how he was justified? If so, then he can boast, hey, I was pretty good. I did thus and so, and I got salvation for it. But what does the scripture say, verse 3? Avraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, as grace, but as what is due. When you get that paycheck, when Dave writes paycheck to those who work for him, he's giving them what is due them. He's not doing that out of grace. He's not doing that just because now he might have given them a Christmas bonus, might have been something they didn't earn, and he did it to show goodness toward them. But when you get your wage, that's something that you've earned, and he, that's what's being said here. Now, the one who works, his wage is not accredited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, I'm not working for my justification. It's all on the Lord. His faith is credited as righteous. What do I get? I get the grace of God. I get his righteousness. I didn't earn it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. It's given to me by God himself. That's what happened to Abraham. Verse 13, same chapter 4. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. How are they going to become heirs to all? Through faith, not through their earning it. Verses 16 and on. For this reason, it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace. Grace is not what you 
have earned. Grace is just given to you. God's riches at Christ's expense, someone once did for the letters, is unmerited favor. You didn't earn it. This faith is given in accordance with grace that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. So it's saying when the law was in effect and they kept the law to show their faith, and of course they had to keep the sacrificial system because they couldn't keep the law perfectly, but when they did that, that showed their faith, they were saved. But Abraham was saved before there was law. There was nothing that he was doing. He is just given to us that by grace he was saved, by faith he was saved, and he's the father of us all. As it's written, a father of many nations I have made you. See, yes, you'll have many descendants also in the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead. Remember, he gave Isaac out of a dead body and calls into being that which does not exist. God created it all. Yeshua, Jesus created it all. In hope against hope he believed, so that he might become the father of many nations, according to which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. And yet we also know from Galatians, it came down specifically, so shall your descendant be. Both being true. Yes, you're going to have a family line. Yes, you're going to have a lot, but it's going to come down to this one, and you only get from that one through your faith. It's only in hope in Yeshua. And when we say hope in that way, it's a sure hope. It's not, I hope it won't rain. That's the hope of Israel. This is the promise. And it was given before there was a law, before there was anything he could have done to earn it. And so in hope against hope, it's too great to be true, God, but I believe it. That's what was spoken with verse 19. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief but grew strong in faith. See, he grew in his faith, Dora. That answers your question. He grew in his faith, and as he grew in his faith, and I lost my place, sorry, uh, grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. He glorified God. Remember, the heavens are declaring the glory of God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. You know what that saying, Abraham was saying, God, I don't know how you can do that, but I 100% believe you. And he trusted implicitly and completely. He did not waver, not, he didn't, oh, I don't know. <laughs> You know, we all know when someone is promising us something that they might or might not be able to deliver. God was, I mean, Abraham was saying, God, I don't know how you can do this, but I believe you. And because of that, he could take it to the bank. And it was, and it does tell us that being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited. Here's our word again. Counted, reckoned. It was calculated to his account credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited. In other words, what happened to Abraham can happen to you. You can have that faith, believe in God, say, I don't know how you, now for us we have to say did it, but up until Yeshua did it, they were saying how you will do it. But I believe you, and in that same way that Avraham, it was credited to his account, is credited to our account, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, Yeshua, our Adonai, from the dead. Just as sure as Yeshua has been resurrected, I bank on the fact I will be in heaven one day. That's my eternal home on the basis of the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus. Have I seen it? No. Do I have evidence in my house right here? Do I have you know paper that can say this is exactly what happened? Yes. It's called the Word of God. And I take it as inerrant, infallible, trustworthy, and I apply it and I say, God, the same way Abraham believed it would, I believe it did. And I have credited to me, not by my works, yes, through his love letter. Not by my works, not by me having a brainiac brain because I don't, <laughs> but in the simple faith like a child. I believe God. I take him at his word. And he signed the check 
take it to the bank, folks. He signed it. Cash in. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions, our sins, and was raised because of our justification. If Yeshua had not raised from the dead, he would have conquered sin. But he had to conquer the consequences of sin, death. He conquered it all by him being raised from the dead. We are made justified. We're made right with God. We are declared righteous. We have the righteousness of God put on us also. Do you know how important this is? Let me tell you. Remember if God says it once? It's important. If he tells you twice, pay attention. By the time he tells you four different times, I think he's really saying, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Get it. Put the exclamation mark after it. In our scriptures, in the New Covenant, four times he quotes the original covenant. Four times he talks about Abraham believing in faith and it being imputed to him for righteousness. We have it in Romans 4, 1 to 3, where we just read. Verses 9 and 10 were the second time. Then we have it in verses 19 through 24. So three of the times were right here in this chapter. When you look at chapter 4 again in Romans, you will see three different times it talks about Abraham and uses him specifically. And the fourth time we're going to go to right now, and that is Galatians 3, verses 5 through 7, and I will show it to you another time. So anyone who thinks that they can have the new without the old, why I don't call it old because it's not antiquated, why I call it original because it's where God originated his message, it's sometimes um, concealed in the original, but it's fully revealed in the new when it is, it went dead. I'm going to stay loud because I just want you to, to I want us to keep going. Galatians 3, 5 through 7. So then, does I'm sorry. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? How does God do what He does? Because you work it? Because the law declares it? No, it's by our faith, and we see the miracles all around us. Even so, verse six. Here we go. Perfect time to get the it back on. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Is that a direct quote? Yes, for the fourth time, God is pulling it out of Bereshit in the beginning and bringing it into the, the time there in Romans and with the Galatians. Therefore, verse 7, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. You want to be a son of Abraham, you've got to have his faith. That's what it's telling us, that we can have the same faith Abraham had, we get the same results. We get to be declared righteous. We get to wear the robe of righteousness. And that's what I wanted to bring out to you. And I'm looking for my verse. There it is. It's coming. Okay. So his faith, Abraham's faith, was to become a pattern for all believers. It's before the law. It's even before circumcision was given. Some people say oh, it's got to be by circumcision. Yeah, God internally circumcises the heart. But it was before even the outward expression of circumcision was given. That's not for until another um, chapter 17. But Romans 4 that we just read, 9 and 10, it lets us know this happened before the law. This happened before circumcision. This predates all of that. And what the word means when you break down what righteousness means, it can be expressed this way. And this is what I love. This is my crescendo. And we're going to end on this note today. It means right clothing okay right clothing now what do i mean by that let me tell you about the sinner go with me real fast to genesis 3 10 Bereshit chapter 3 and verse 10 genesis 3 10 and let's see what the sinner is wearing and we all are sinners we know that everyone from adam forward is a sinner adam was the first he sinned he brought it into the human race in Genesis 3 and verse 10, we have, he said, this is Adam, Adam. He said, I heard the sound of you, God, in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. The sinner has no clothing. He's not wearing the right clothing. He has no clothing. He is in his sin. He is naked before God. 
Now, go with me to Revelation 3.17 because I'm giving you bird's eye view. <laughs> so fly over. We start in the beginning. Let's go toward the end. Revelation 3 and verse 17. Revelation 3.17 says, and this is to the Laodicean church. This is the church that thinks it's got it all right, thinks it's so great, and it's blind, and it's, well, let's read what the problem is. In verse 17, it says, because you say, God's speaking to the church of Laodicea, and this is for those who think because they're sitting in a church, they're all right with God. Same thing, okay? Because you say, I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. You don't know how wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked you are. They thought they were great. They thought they had all right. They were strutting before God. It's like the emperor's new clothes, and he was wearing nothing. You are naked before your God. Now go with me and see what our God does. Isaiah, Yeshua, Yeshua, Isaiah 61. I love this. God is so awesome. 61 and verse 10. And in this verse we read, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. Are you rejoicing today? Is your heart just pounding through this lesson? I hope it is. Result in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. You know what he did? He put a robe on Abraham, the robe of righteousness. He put his robe on Abraham because Abraham was naked, because Adam, Adam was naked. We all are naked. Our, our clothing, Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6, our righteousness is as filthy rags. I don't want to be wearing filthy rags. I don't want to be wearing rags at all. I don't want to be uncovered and embarrassed by my nakedness. I want to be clothed in the garment of my God, the garment of my salvation, the robe of his righteousness. And he says that we are decked out like a bride for her bridegroom. Isn't that love wrapped all up? in his robe of righteousness. No one could say Avram was righteous because he will obey, because he fulfilled the religious laws, because he did this ritual, because he sat in a church pew, because he was born in America, because he was born Christian. No, he became a believer. He believed in God. It was counted to him for righteousness. So God took the robe of Yeshua, dropped it on Abraham and said, look, you are righteous in my sight. Hallelujah. That's what he does with every single one who comes to him. He clothes them in his robe of righteousness. Praise God. One size does fit all. Whether you're tall or short, fat or thin, his robe covers you all and washes away the multitude of sins. Hallelujah. Oh, what Abraham saw, mind-blowing, yes. Can we chew on this for a week? I think so. I think I gave you a whole meal. I think you ought to feel pretty satisfied. I didn't even begin to get near the second part that's so hard to know where to start and stop. God took care of it. I just babbled enough that we don't need it. This class will take all of that in its entirety in the next class. So we're going to see what he inherits. And let me, let me tantalize you to come back. If this class wasn't enough to make you want to keep studying and coming back, we're going to see in the verses that follow in these animals, if you've glanced ahead, we're going to see a picture of Calvary. Again, the gospel in a nutshell, we're going to see what's given in the original is, is openly done in our new, but it's all there in the original. And if you, if you want to cut off the original and say, oh, I just need the new, how can you understand the new without the foundation? How can you understand what's being revealed if you haven't seen it concealed? How can you see it? It just, it just flows. And I get so excited because I want to say to my dear Jewish people, take a peek. Mm -hmm. It's so Jewish on the other side of what you call Malachi. It's so Jewish in that new covenant. You'll be amazed. You'll realize you don't give up your Jewishness. You don't stop any of that. You're going to believe in the Jewish Messiah who was foretold in the original. 
and it's going to show you how it all comes together. And then the crescendo of all crescendos, we've got the end of the story, folks. I've read the final chapter. Spoiler, spoiler alert. <laughs> the Lord wins. He comes back. He rules and reigns. And guess from where? Jerusalem, comma, Israel. Hallelujah. That's our God. He is so great, so awesome, so amazing. And that's just millennial rule for a thousand years. You know what a thousand years is like in God's book? A day. Just a day. Just one day. What's going to happen on the next day, God? And the next day. And the next day. Can we just go hang out with your creation out there and see the beauty and see what you unfold for us? And I think God says, okay, sure. Let's go together. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a God. I get high. I'm up in the stars. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need any earthly substance to get me high. I just get the word of God and I start <laughs> exploding all over the place. So before I totally lose everybody who doesn't want to explode like me, and you don't have to. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer. Honor our God. Praise him. He, isn't he not worthy of awe and adoration? You know, the wonder of it all, I told you, I was a broken record. If you've been with me, that started in the, the first week of December, and I wanted it all through the season, end of the season. I said, Lord, you're the, the reason for every season. Can we keep the wonder going? And I think he just did. <laughs> I give you my awesome God, ineffable, wonderful. Oh, Lord God. Words still fall short. We need more words than ineffable and indescribable and awesome and amazing, adoring you, falling on our faces before you, jumping up and shouting your praises, singing your hallelujahs, and knowing we get to do this throughout all of eternity in the midst of your creation. Oh, Lord, praise you. Thank you. Thank you for your living word. Thank you that it lights a fire inside of us. And Lord, let us shine it out. Let us get out there and explode all over this world that needs to hear it and needs to know. And Lord, we pray for any others who are trusting in themselves, who are trusting in a church, who are trusting in being born into the right family or the right country, whatever reason they give, Lord, may their eyes be open. May the veil of blindness over our Jewish brethren be removed that they might see the glory of our God that they might see you, Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, and do just as Abraham did. See your day and rejoice. Hallelujah. Thank you for clothing those of us who come in faith believing with your very robe, your robe of righteousness. Thank you that you see us righteous, that we might one day be in your very presence. Hallelujah. Praise you. Thank you. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm done. I'm going to lose it, so I'm done. <laughs>